Welcome to The Psychology of Change, Creating an Environment Where Improvement Can Thrive. This webinar is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and hosted by the Healthcare Homes Initiative in partnership with the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement, often referred to as ICSI. My name is Carol Bauer. By the end of our webinar today, participants will be able to describe one clinic's journey to establish its quality improvement department one conversation at a time, explain the importance of psychology and psychological safety in quality improvement, and lastly, list the four interconnected elements in Deming's system of profound knowledge. I'll introduce our speakers in a minute, but let's uh, first review a few housekeeping items. To prevent feedback and sound problems, please put your phones on mute by pressing star six. Please don't put your phones on hold as that sometimes uh, causes feedback. We invite your questions through the chat function and we'll address them uh, as many as we can in the last 10 minutes of the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce, introduce our speakers. Alyssa Palmer is Director of Quality at Southside Community Health Services in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She began her career in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit as a patient care assistant. For the past 20 years, she has worked primarily in leadership positions in women's health care. Alyssa believes that all staff contribute to the success of an organization and makes staff engagement a priority in all her projects. An educator at heart, Alyssa understands the importance of camaraderie and teamwork and having intent and passion behind quality improvement. Sarah Horst is a project manager and healthcare consultant at the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement. She leads ICSI Workshop, the training center at ICSI offering courses on improvement science, motivational interviewing, teamwork, and collaborative communication. Her, her 13 years of experience in healthcare include roles in the areas of quality improvement and practice transformation, clinical operations, measurement, total cost of care, patient experience, and creating healthy workplace dynamics. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Sarah, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Carol. Um, well, I'm glad to be here today. Um, I'm from ICSI, and for those of you who aren't familiar with ICSI, we've been a trusted influencer in healthcare for over 25 years. ICSI convenes organizations to find solutions to healthcare's toughest challenges. And we are currently focused on the opioid epidemic and mental health, as well as Medicaid. Uh, ICSI is an independent, objective nonprofit organization with one clear goal, and that's improving health together. And many of you also know that we do a lot of quality improvement training, as Carol mentioned, and it's nice to see a lot of familiar names on today's attendee list. So glad you're here. We're gonna start by just thinking, today's the psychology of change and how it impacts improvement. So I wanna just talk a little bit about how you feel about improvement. And um, just by yourself, um, how do you feel about it? Do you love it? Um, I gotta advance my slide, sorry. Uh, do, you look, do you hate it? Do you look forward to it? Is it easy? Is it hard? Um, how, well, um, how well do you do it? How challenging is it? Um, we have a lot of feelings when it comes to quality improvement. So um, a lot of times I, I always ask audiences this and sometimes I kind of get that hairball response of, ugh, well, if I have to. Um, and uh, I want to kind of explore that a little bit. Um, so having, having assessed your feelings, I want you to put it aside uh, and let's just think about improvement, not quality improvement, not work, just improvement. Um, and let's talk about everyday improvement. I'm imagining that many of you have more than one route to work. Um, and that's an improvement project. You have a goal, you wanna to get to work usually by a certain time. Uh, and maybe you have to drop people off. Maybe you need to pick something up. Maybe you wanna get coffee or maybe there's road construction. But I know many of us get in the car, it's like, which route am I gonna to take today? I live by a stoplight. And depending on what it looks like, I may take a different route. So um, if you have a goal, in this case, getting to work on time, you try something, you assess how it went, and you do something different based on that, that's an improvement project. Likewise, I know many of you cook or eat, uh, and we have some goals there too. We want it to taste good or not take too long. So if you've ever made a recipe and said, huh, would I add salt? Would I maybe cook it longer or shorter? Or maybe that tasted good, but uh, maybe the, as they say, the, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. 
that's an improvement project. I tried something, I assessed how it went, and then I did something based on that. When we were learning to ride our bike, when we fell off, what did we do? We got back on. We are hardwired to be natural improvers. And yet, we're more likely to test and accept changes at home than we are at work. Because at home, there's a perception of safety. Eh, if you don't like it, you know, eat it anyway. Or, eh, you know, it's so, oops, I was a few minutes late to work. No big deal. Um, but at work, we feel risk and consequence. And they may be real or they may be perceived. So we take those of us who are natural improvers and kind of happy to try things out in our real world. We walk through the door at work and up goes a barrier. And suddenly, improvement is a thing with potentially a hairball reflex. How do we get past that? And what I think a lot of people are stuck on, it's not the what. We know what improvement looks like. We've read the literature. We know the clinic over there is doing that. We know what best practice is. It's usually not the what. It's usually the how. And sometimes the how feels like a bit of a magic unicorn in that I know what I want to do, but I just can't get the people to do it. And that's why we're here today to talk about the psychology of change. And to do that, I'm going to go to some classic improvement science, and we're going to talk about W. Edwards Deming. Um, he is largely considered the godfather of quality improvement, and he created his system of profound knowledge. Um, and so I'm going to walk through. He said there were really four elements that needed to be present in order for a management system to be successful, especially for improvement. So the first is appreciation for system, and this is kind of classic quality improvement that we think about. Um, that's um, where you realize that the system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And in the appreciation for the system, we might use like the five whys or a root cause analysis or process mapping to deeply understand the problem. He moves on to the theory of variation. And so many of us, when we think of quality improvement, it's all data, data, statistical analysis, run charts. And that's certainly a very important part of really understanding um, improvement. And then uh, the third part is theory of knowledge. And this is where we might see our small tests of change, or PDSA, plan, do, study, act cycles, um, and use scientific methods, the model for improvement, which applies three questions. Um, what are we trying to accomplish? How will we know the changes in improvement? And what changes could we make um, that would result in improvement? Um, this is where you do your small iterative tests of change. Now, when we think of quality improvement, so many of us just kind of sit here like, this is it. These are the tools I need to use. Uh, and they are. And this is the science of improvement. But what's often overlooked is the fourth component um, in Deming's Wheel of Profound Knowledge, and that's psychology. Um, this is where science meets art. Um, Deming sought to maximize the value people bring to the organization, and that requires giving them pride in work and freedom to use their brain, tools to be effective, and systems that allow people to practice continual improvement. So creating that environment where people could flourish was really key to Deming's thinking. Um, and so the job of the manager wasn't to motivate the people. It was to remove barriers to joy at work. And so we know, in many ways, we're all just a, ball, a big ball of feelings and emotions which affect our thinking, which affect our behavior, which ultimately affect our outcomes. What we know is that what I call Nike quality improvement doesn't work. The mandate, just do it. And we keep trying over and over and over, and then we get frustrated. And that's where we uh, come to today is the psychology. Any, when I train quality improvement, the number one concern I get is I just can't get them to buy in. And that goes to it's not the what. I know what I want to do. It's the how. And so I'm really excited um, to introduce our next speaker, Alyssa, um, from Southside Community Health Services. Um, when we, we were doing this webinar, she's the first person I thought of as a partner. She is rebuilding Southside's Quality Improvement Department one thoughtful conversation at a time, and she's really practicing the art and psych of improvement. She is laying a foundation built on trust in the art of change. So um, I will, with that, I'll turn it over to Alyssa. Thanks so much, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, perfect. Um, so I just wanted to say real quick too how grateful I am for this opportunity to share our story with you all. Um, before I get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my own journey. Um, as uh, Dorothy had mentioned earlier, I started, and Carol had started, um, had mentioned earlier, I started my career in healthcare working as a PCA in the pediatric ICU at Cincinnati Children's Hospital while I was in my third year of nursing school. There, I learned and absorbed what family and patient-centered care was, and later I would recognize that as actually a foundation to what I expect from myself, my colleagues, and the organizations in which I'm a part of. In the middle of my fourth year of nursing school, I chose a different path um, and got married and pregnant, not necessarily in the head order, which led me to a new city and into private OBGYN for the next 14 years. In these clinics, I had multiple roles. I worked as a certified labor doula, certified childbirth educator, a medical assistant, an EMR super user, and I managed both front and back office staff. Leaving private clinics that primarily served middle to upper class fully insured patients to join a community health center has opened my eyes to a new reality. I joined Southside Community Health Services last December, um, almost a year ago today, um, as the Director of Quality, and I've recently been selected to serve on the QI Advisory Board for the National Association for Community Health Centers. So now that I've shared my own story, I want to share a little bit about ours at Southside. And we all know that everyone has a story to tell, but I feel like I'm airing our dirty laundry a little bit with this slide. But I wanted to be authentic in sharing our journey. My first couple of days at Southside, I shadowed people from each department. I believe this was critical not only to learn the different components of each role and how they were integrated into how we function, but it also provided me insight into the organization's cultural history and gave me a clear idea of what our challenges were. I learned that I had joined Southside shortly after an organizational layoff and the wounds were still fresh. People wanted to share their story with me, unsolicited. Their openness and the safety that they felt in sharing their stories with me would actually later become the foundation to one of our current projects, but more on that later. What you see here are some of the things that I heard my first weeks at Southside. But what I want you to take away from this is that these comments and attitudes were not barriers. I saw them as opportunities. Even to this day, people still comment that they have never seen the quality person so much. Being visual is a vital part of wanting, if you want colleagues to buy what you're selling. Oh, wow, I thought the quality person just did reporting stuff. I don't know if we have a policy on that. Oh, I only became the measure champion because I was asked to. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, some people were let go. Everyone has just kind of done what they wanted. It's not all about the data. Well, things change, but no one really tells us. Oh, I don't know really why we do that. So, as you know, it's scary when you come to the realization that you may have a much larger and longer journey ahead of you than you had anticipated. But the good news, and for those who know me can attest to this, I am super competitive and not at all afraid of challenges. So it was time to blaze the trail. The benefit of having worked in so many various roles in my career is that I knew much of what needed to be fixed was largely due to process improvement. I also knew firsthand from experience that Change is more difficult when it's coming from the people who are not familiar with the work. The people who do the work have the best ideas, and that's an important concept not only to understand and absorb as a quality person, but to instill in the team as well, because it truly takes a village. So I started with focus groups, and each group is made up of one person from each department. It's all voluntary, but I'll be honest, it took a little coaxing for some people. This was new to them. But this was a way for us to start small. It not only allowed me to educate staff um, on the specific quality measures, but to also get an idea for what they already knew, which, because quality had taken a back seat, wasn't a whole lot. I do want to point out that these clinical quality measures are UDS measures and that we are required to report on them um, as a federally qualified health center. So the depression measure that you see here is defined as depression screening, not remission. Our focus groups have input on the PDSA cycles, workflow changes, policies, patient outcome improvement, patient engagement. It works because we're collaborating with the people who do the work. We're engaging staff to make the changes. It's also a place to share experiences that otherwise may be intimidating to share with a large group. It allows me to, re to reach a small amount of people at a time and use them to spread the word to their departments. 
for us, it's been it's proven to be a way to cultivate champions who can be early adapters of the changes that we're hoping to make. People who can test the changes and demonstrate their value. One thing that I've learned in process improvement is that small-scale projects yield quicker results. As I continued to gradually put the puzzle pieces together to incorporate quality into our everyday work, it was evident that people weren't being defiant or even if it felt like they were, they just didn't know. They didn't see the importance because it had never been explained to them. I began sharing our clinical quality measures on our visual management board, which I'll share in a moment. Through a couple trials and errors, I finally set, settled on this scoreboard format that allowed people to see our history, our goals, and where we are at currently with our clinical quality measures. I also include a tip or two of the month to capture the work that we're doing and how to capture the work that we're doing in our EMR system, sometimes snippets from our policies, with the hope that these tips will be better retained when presented in small increments. One of the barriers I learned, like many clinics, is our EMR system. While there are a million ways of documenting something, our report is only capturing one of those ways. I created our own guide to clinical quality measures that defines each measure and what we're looking to achieve from UDS and MNCOM and exactly how to do that in our EMR system using the correct smart phrase or which document or where to document in which section. Each clinical measure is broken out into the department responsibilities, the MA, the RN, the provider, and in some cases the front desk because, again, it takes a village. We all have a role in this. The last week of November, we held a staff meeting where we introduced this resource and went over the measures in depth and answered any questions that people had, and they had a lot. This resource was intended to be a reference for staff and a training tool for new staff. And finally, we've been working hard to develop our clinical policies and procedures around these clinical quality measures. When we finalize them, we load them into our online learning management system with a short competency quiz. We assign the course to all staff who have a part in the workflow no matter how big or small. We also have redesigned our quarterly peer reviews to reflect these policies and procedures. Sometimes people hear the term policy and it feels a bit like someone is taking or telling them how to practice or perform. However, I have found that without them, we send the unspoken message that we have low performance standards and people get almost too comfortable to even engage or welcome new ideas. Of all the things that we've talked about, focus groups, scorecards, policies, education, there's a common theme and that is communication. One thing that was glaring from, for, to me from our casual conversations was the frustration with the lack of communication in our organization. A colleague who had experience with visual management boards suggested that we start one. It's an easy way for staff to stay connected to our work. Our visual management board includes clinical quality measures, which I post our monthly scorecard along with a month-to-month -month compar comparison, our productivity trends, our quality work plan, which shows all of our QI and QA projects and where we're at with them. This template was generously shared with me by a colleague in the QI world. We include all of our patient and staff satisfaction survey results, which we do each quarterly. We uh, include new patient or new employee highlights, um, idea and suggestion sheets, and something that we call our stoplight board, which um, is a way for us to communicate different changes, the ideas and suggestions that employees uh, fill out on that on the visual management board. We actually discuss at our monthly management meetings and then add them to the stop sheet or stoplight sheet with a status update. And I update this board monthly or more frequently as needed. Now we're all familiar with campaigns and pushes. I recently did a spur of the moment PDSA for colorectal cancer. I went through two days of a provider schedule of provider schedules and listed out all the patients who needed colorectal cancer screening, who they were seeing, what time their appointment was, and I, hand, I handed out the list to the providers and the MAs and said, winner gets a free coffee. To add some extra fun, we called it a competition. Every single patient on that list received their IFOB. Four of them returned them the following week, and the remaining patients all scheduled lab appointments to return their kits, which is part of our workflow policy. However, we later learned that three of the patients actually collected incorrectly. But I still considered this a success. Not only did 11 patients get screened for colorectal cancer, we were able to confirm that our workflow does indeed still work. 
patients not only received their colorectal cancer screening, but we also identified areas that needed improvement, education on the collection of the specimen. And this led to conversations that ultimately led us to decide we needed to create our own IFOB collection instruction sheet for our patients. This test, if you will, only lasted for two days. However, many campaigns last longer than that, and um, we, once they're over, we quickly forget that what, what it was that was driving us to begin with. Something that was momentarily important becomes old news once it's out of the spotlight. The other thing that I've noticed about campaigns and pushes, they are mentally and emotionally exhausting. Another comment that I used to hear frequently when I first joined Southside was, oh, we used to do that, but we stopped. I don't know why. Or, yeah, we did that for a while. I think somebody was doing that for a project. I discovered that Southside had a history of doing campaigns and pushes for different measures over an extended period of time, much longer than two days. And in healthcare, PDSA campaigns can be good to motivate people and they are an excellent way to test and do maintenance on existing workflows, like what we saw with the IFOB competition, but not necessarily for long-term quality care. We also know that exhaustion leads to burnout, and when we get exhausted and burnout is evident, we forget why we're doing the push or the campaign. We become apathetic to the purpose. Perhaps some of us didn't even know why we were doing the push to begin with. Maybe it was just the flavor of the month, or maybe they picked up that we were short on meeting our goal. Maybe they, didn't, they, they did it only because they were told to. We always, what does that mean? This is a concept that we are working hard to adopt. It means that we aren't screening people for colorectal cancer because we want a coffee on the house or because colorectal cancer screening month, because it's colorectal cancer screening month or because we need to reach our clinical quality measure goal. We always screen people for colorectal cancer because we don't want our patients reflected in the sobering statistics around colorectal cancer related deaths. We don't screen our patients for depression simply because it's National Depression Screening Day or because we have to improve our measure by 5% for a gain share or because HRSA requires us to. We always screen our patients for depression because we want them to live long, happy, productive lives and not be reflected in the increasing suicide rates in Minnesota because we care about our patients. Data is what helps tell our story and our story is not that we're just checking the boxes. Our story is that we strive to provide excellent care to our patients always from the moment that they reach our clinic for the first time. So what are we working on now? We're doing What Matters Conversations. This was inspired by the Finding Joy in Work course through the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Our executive director has asked this question multiple times with, to be met with pure silence, not even crickets chirping. Using the momentum of the people's openness and willingness to share in my early days with Southside, we decided that we would try one-on-one -on -one conversations between me and individual staff. I don't have any direct reports, so there is no feeling of threat and they have nothing to lose. And in these conversations, I listen to what matters most, what motivated them to work in healthcare or more specifically in community health, what is their ideal workplace, and what are the pebbles in their shoes or even the boulders in their way to making it that ideal workplace. It gives me the opportunity to recruit people also to a Finding Joy in Work focus group for next year. In that focus group, we'll address the pebbles and the boulders that were identified in my one-on-one -on -one What Matters conversations. And this is the base for improving psychological safety in our organization for our goal next year. The other thing that we're working on, as mentioned earlier, is updating and creating our policies and procedures. We now keep updated policies in a shared company drive. And as I mentioned earlier, some clinical policies are pushed out to our, our learning management system with competency quizzes. The idea behind this is that without a policy in place, we lose accountability. Workflows become suggestions and optional, and providing excellent patient care is not optional. And lastly, we're revamping our onboarding for new hires to increase leadership visibility and communication right off the bat. I've created a program that includes short presentations from the directors of all departments that will hold quarterly. This is an opportunity for us to make leaders visible and to give them the opportunity to share important aspects of their department. It will also give our executive director the opportunity to really explain what our history is, what we do, and why it is so important. And it gives me the opportunity to explain the importance of quality and passion and collaboration and to let people know that their ideas are always welcome. 
these are some of the uh, quality resources that I use on a regular basis, some of them almost daily. Um, ICSI, I can honestly say that I have not been to a single training or seminar that I have not taken something away from. They are fantastic. Um, IHI, the Institute of, uh, for Healthcare Improvement, are experts in change management and have fantastic resources available as well. The Finding Joy in Work series is uh, through IHI and as a bonus for those working in an FQHC, you can receive a 50% discount on many of their programs. And high tech provides resources for the IT and regulatory reporting components to quality work. And my favorite is networking. If you have an issue or a problem, I can guarantee that you have a colleague in the field that has either worked through it already or is going through the same thing. It's important to connect with people, bounce ideas off each other, take those ideas home and run your own small PDSA on them and your own clinic and make them your own. As I said earlier, it takes a village. And in closing, I want to share uh, this image of the Wizard of Oz gang. Um, I like this image for many reasons, but to me, it represents everything we need to get to uh, where we're going. Oz represents our common goal, the quadruple aim, driven to provide top quality patient care and an affordable cost in a psychologically safe environment. The group itself, arms locked together, skipping merrily with a shared purpose, even the shared apprehension um, down the yellow brick road represents collaboration, the village that I spoke about. The Tin Man represents the heart and the passion that we need and sometimes that we even lose and need to find again to reconnect with. The Lion represents the courage we need to persevere and move forward, to try new things and to welcome change because that can be very scary. And the scarecrow represents the innovation needed to work smarter and not harder. He represents the data that we need to use to tell our story. And door three represents the intent behind what we do. She's driven and she's on a mission. She has a vision. In Toto, the cute little yapper represents the joy that we need to remember to include in our everyday work, a vital component to minimizing burnout and delivering top quality care. And with that said, I hope that this has been super helpful for you all, and I hope also to hear some of your own journeys building your own quality departments. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hey, thank you for a great webinar. That was really great. Um, I will remind people that they are invited to submit questions through the chat function. Do we have any yet, Dorothy? No, we do not. All right, well, um, think about what questions you have to ask of, of Sarah or Alyssa. And in the meantime, I'll start things off with a couple of questions. Um, one thing that you said, Alyssa, was that, you know, change works best with the people who are actually doing the work. But I think one of the things we often hear um, from clinics is that, yeah, leadership's not really on board. So um, barrier number one. So you were you were hired into a position that was not new in your clinic, as I understand it, but you kind of made it your own. So how did you bring people along, and especially bringing people at the leadership level along? Sure. And that's something that is still part of our journey, actually. Um, but um, previously, before my role, this is actually the first time that we've had a quality director. Um, uh, before me, um, there were dual roles with our nursing manager and um, and then similar, the person, my predecessor actually um, was was very much so, um, you know, to to share some of the quotes that I heard early on um, with Southside. And she was just a reporter. She didn't, she wasn't um, doing a whole lot of change management. Um, and the wonderful thing that we have going for us is that our executive director, I like to call her a yes person. Um, she um, lives and breathes that philosophy that if you have an idea, you try it. And if it doesn't work, you tweak it and you try again, the, the classic PDSA. Um, and so it really helps having that top leadership um, support in that, in that way. Um, for me, in, in our journey, the challenging part has been our core leaders, so um, otherwise known as middle management. You know, there are, are clinically our managers and supervisors, and and um, helping them and educating them on the importance of quality and how. Um, when we talk about quality, it's it's not just me as a one-person department, but quality as an organization as a whole. Um, that we are in this together and and helping them understand the importance of, of why we're doing what we're doing and why data is so important um, to tell our story. 
Fantastic. Anything yet, Dorothy? Uh, yes, we have one question. What method or approach do you take to prioritize QI work and competing demands slash projects? No, we um, start very small um, with our with our projects, and it helps to have these focus groups so that we have small teams working on things at a time. Um, and our we have um, you know kind of organizational um, or leadership even level wide um, have decided on the um, our priorities as far as. Um, what our focus groups are on. So the, uh, for clinical quality measures, our hypertension, depression, and diabetes, those were our top ones. Um, and then from there, even in those focus groups, we um, are doing things like the patient satisfaction surveys or patient engagement surveys and whatnot. So um, these focus groups really make it easier to prioritize certain things, that projects that seem really big, when you have a bunch of hands in the pot helping with it, it doesn't seem so overwhelming. Thank you. Um, any more? Okay, I'll, I'll continue the questions here. Um, I was pretty fascinated with, with that, what you said about the small changes, and I know, Sarah, you've talked about this in your trainings, too. So the whole idea about campaigns and pushes, it seems like, you know, so much energy goes into formulating these things, and it, it really is kind of fun to put them together, but then sustaining them over the long haul is really, like you said, it's exhausting. <laughs> so um, what, what advice do you have to people about, you know, how much energy do you put into these things, and when, when do you call it cooked, and how do you get people on board to, to keep them in there for the amount of time that, that's appropriate and then sustain the energy, but maybe not the campaign. Sure. Well, and that's where the policies come in. I think that um, these campaigns and pushes are great when they're used in, you know, short, small increments um, and, um, and, and transitioning from the term, you know, campaign and push to a test of change. Um, where we can use the, that information. How well did it work? Did it, you know, a, a lot of times we are making these decisions. I can, I can, you know, speak even personally about this in, in private healthcare where, um, you know, people are, people are sitting in a, in a room who don't do the work and then they come out and they say, we want you to do this because we all have the common goal, but they, they don't quite understand how it's going to impact, um, the people who do the work. And, um, and so when, when we do these, you know, two-day um, and sometimes even one-day um, pushes or tests of change, um, then we can quickly see that, oh, my gosh, our front desk is, is they're just completely overwhelmed. They can't give, or give our patients an, another form. It's just, it's never going to work, you know, or, um, or our MAs are already collecting so much or our provider, you know, so it, it gives us the information that we need immediately um, so that we can develop these policies and procedures. And, and that's when those policies and procedures become our way of life. It's, it's what we're always doing. You know, we're, all, we're always, um, you know, checking, checking our patients with high blood pressure if they have a high blood pressure. We're always checking it three times. It's just what we do. We're not just doing it because we need to meet our measure or, um, you know, because it's hypertension month or, or whatever, or because we have a new grant, or this is what we always do because we know that it works. Sarah, did you want to add anything based on your experience with uh, other groups you're working with? Um, I think it's a dose question. I echo everything Alyssa's saying. I think what she's describing is kind of what we often forget to build into improvement projects, which is maintenance where it's kind of that shiny object and then when the resources leave everything goes down and this is i think really essential for embedding and hardwiring a little two-day check-in on a topic that's supposed to be embedded and hardwired and it's not for shame like ha we caught you it's uh where are we at what can we learn and what do we need to do to make sure we're back to where we want to be so i think their approach is really brilliant Thank you. Any more, Dorothy? We do have one more question. It's, uh, I think it's for Alyssa. This is how important was the role of your leadership that helped your work? Um, 
Do you mean as a director of quality or in my past? Um, there's an addendum to the question. It's what specific things did leaders do to help? So I don't know if that clarifies. Sure. So um, our leaders are actually part of our focus group too. Um, our, our focus groups, I should say. Our medical director tries to attend um, all of them, but our clinic manager attends, does attend all of them. Um, and so that helps with, um, you know, um, not only getting their buy-in, so to speak, but also because they're a part of. Again, it's all it's all about making sure that we're collaborating and that um, that they that their ideas are heard as well, and that they also understand the importance of this, um, and also understand the importance of engaging their staff and also holding their staff accountable for that matter. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's how we we get them on board. Okay, um, so, and you've been doing this for how long, Alyssa, in your role? I've been with Southside for a year now. A year. And, and it's so, my first job in quality. <laughs> and and at, a, at the one year mark, I mean, how are you feeling? And how, how are the people in your clinic feeling about QI now versus when you started? You know, I hear so frequently how um, much they love having the knowledge that they lacked before. Um, I hear frequently how um, they love me. You know, before I came, they didn't. They just didn't know where we were at with certain things, and and that's a big piece of this. Is that um, in in our, in our historically our organization just um, it, it was really on the back burner. So. Um, you know, like I said, when I uh, the things that I heard and people um, the comments that people would make, it just it was evident that um, it wasn't so much that they didn't have an interest in it; they just didn't know. Um, and so that was a big piece of making sure that um, you know that we could that I needed to educate people on on not only the importance but what exactly we were looking at. Um, and then getting their opinions on them, and everybody has opinions, which is fantastic. And um, and the important the important thing too is making sure that we are maintaining and, and fostering that culture um, with of psychological safety, so that they feel comfortable coming to me or anybody and sharing those ideas that they have because they're brilliant. Yeah, you you make a good point. I mean. That's one of the rules of collaboration is that you don't ask for information without giving it back, right? And letting right. it, letting people know why it's relevant and what they can, how they can help to improve things. And so, um, I think that's something that we tend to forget. Those of us who are data collectors is collecting is just one side of the problem. The other side is doing something with that data and giving it back to the people who are producing that data. So, thanks for bringing that up. Um, anything else? Okay, I, one other piece I really liked that, that you did was the, the visual management board. I mean, that's pretty cool uh, way for people to kind of visually have a quick grab on everything. So did you come up with all that stuff all by yourself? Did you see some models out there that you adapted for your own use? How did you come up with all that? Um, so I had, well, the, my, our clinic manager, medical clinic manager, she had had experience um, at her previous organization with visual management boards. So we kind of had an idea, um, but one of our staff surveys actually asked, what do people want to hear or see on these boards? And so we went with that. Um, and, um, you know, there were some things that we wanted to make sure that we included. So the quality measures, um, patient survey results and staff survey results, those things were kind of embedded already um, in our vision. Um, but everything else came from um, what our staff indicated that they were interested in looking at and seeing. All right. And again, going back to your stakeholders, that's, that's great. So um, the work that you're doing with, with finding joy in practice, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Because it's, it's sort of, it's interesting that, you know, a lot of times we hear about administrative burden and all this data collection is just adding to the administrative burden. And yet, if you're using that data and applying it and engaging in problem solving, that is actually one way to restore joy in practice. So it's a little bit of a two sides of the coin. Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah, well, and, and to kind of piggyback off that, um, you know, in 
in finding Julian work, so what we're doing right now is just, um, we're really at the grassroots of it and um, trying to determine, or not trying to determine, but trying to, um, to um, even become aware of what um, these issues are that people have um, that they're experiencing um, that are, are in the way of them finding joy in work and making it their ideal workplace. And, um, and like I said, this is something that we've asked in staff meetings, um, but nobody talks about it. And so um, with these one-on-one -on -one conversations, people are um, a lot more comfortable opening up about these. And the thing about it is that everybody who has a problem doesn't want to just keep having that problem. They don't want to sustain the problem. They want it to be fixed, but they don't know how to go about it. Um, not only about fixing the problem themselves, or sometimes they don't even know where to go or who to go to. And so um, with identifying these, we, I call them pebbles in their shoes, so the little things, the, you know, if that um, one person said, gosh, we're always running out of um, printer paper. Well, that's an easy, that's something that's super frustrating, but an easy fix, that's a pebble. Um, but then there's bigger things like the boulders. So, um, you know, gosh, I feel like we don't get enough communication from such and such department. And, you know, that's that's a boulder of, that's a that's something that we know that needs to be brought to a bigger level and, and how can we improve that. So, um, taking the data from this joy and, and, you know, trying to strive for joy in work is, is really about, fi you know, fixing these problems and addressing them and, and also, um, you know, developing a finding joy in work focus group um, allows them to be a part of that change and, and that problem solution. Okay, Sarah, I want you give, to give you a chance to weigh in on this one too. I know this is something that's um, close to your heart as well. On the joy and work, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it's all you know. What Alyssa's really describing here, she's creating an environment where not only improvement can thrive, but people can thrive. And improvement is a byproduct. It's taking care of needs. It's listening to their wants and desires. It's engaging and activating. Um, and I think that's really what it's all about is then you've, you've cultivated the environment um, where the work can get done, but it is slow and it's one conversation at a time. So um, I just think what Alyssa is describing, like, you know, I go and do these trainings and I like talk to Alyssa, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're doing this. It's just, and I know so many out there are as well, but I think Southside's a really compelling story, especially in that, um, it's really rebuilding a department and really addressing the trauma that comes with change. That's inevitable. All of you have churned through, you know, quality improvement managers. Everybody's doing more with less. And you can still, you know, create that environment. So that's what I think is so compelling and why ICSI really wanted to partner with Southside on this is that um, they've got the same, you know, things going that everybody else does, and they're able to work through them. And I just love calling things, you know, pebbles. So. All right. Well, to close things up, I want to make sure and thank Sarah and Alyssa for a wonderful webinar today. And um, before we close, I want to call your attention to a couple other things that are coming up on the Healthcare Homes Horizon. Uh, watch for two new e-learning courses that are both going to come before the end of the year now. One is on the subject of quality improvement, and this class was developed um, in, in collaboration with ICSI. So make sure and check that out. It's free, it's online. Um, we also are going to be introducing a course on tools for information management and health, exchange, health information exchange. Um, and both of these classes, as I say, can be accessed from our, our website or go directly to the LMS Learning Management System. If you have not already done so, mark your calendars for Learning Days, which will be on April 9th and 10th at the Continuing Education and Conference Center on the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus. Um, things are shaping up for a great event this year and registration will open in January. Registrations for today, registrants for today's webinar will be added to the Healthcare Home Learn Bulletin subscriber list and slides from this webinar and past webinars 
can be found on the Healthcare Home website in the Learning Collaborative webinar archive. You can find recordings of this and other past webinars on the MDH YouTube channel. And you can find that if you go to the front page of the Healthcare Home website and look in the top right corner. To receive a certificate of attendance for participating in today's webinar, please complete the evaluation that will be emailed to you after the webinar. And thanks once again to Alyssa and Sarah, and thanks to all of you for being a part of our learning or healthcare home learning community today and during the past year. We learn best when we learn from each other. So if you have ideas to share, um, we want to hear from you. And so reach out to us. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks, for, thanks again. Bye-bye.